They didn't have any media in ancient Athens. You just needed a loud voice. Who will address the assembly? asked the herald, and any adult male citizen could stand on a large rock platform to speak his mind to thousands of fellow citizens. Speaking freely, examining the facts and weighing the arguments, the ancient Athenians decided to fight the invading Persians at sea, not on land, and they won their battle. Democratic deliberation produced a decision that saved the world's first democracy. Order! Order! Today, our representatives in the British Parliament, male and female, enjoy the same freedom of speech. And this lousy, rotten It was explicitly guaranteed in the 1689 Bill of Rights, a keystone of the Glorious Revolution. Occasionally we can ourselves enjoy the ancient Athenian experience, perhaps in a village hall meeting about a local issue. But our countries are much too large for all of us to get together and debate in person. So we have media. Baby, you understand me now. Radio, television, newspapers and online platforms all mediate our exchanges. But do we have the media we need for an effective democracy? Please don't let me be misunderstood. My guiding principle here is that we require uncensored, diverse, trustworthy media so we can make well-informed decisions and participate fully in political life. First, uncensored. We normally associate the word censorship with a dictatorship. I still possess a Polish censor's verdict from 1989, formally recording that a Polish magazine must remove a great chunk of my article, all the way from the words incompetence of the rulers to party apparatus. China today has what is probably the largest apparatus of censorship in human history. Some of the Chinese Communist Party's instructions to their media are exposed on a website called China Digital Times, based in the United States. For example, after one of the country's high-speed trains crashed, instructions included Do not report on a frequent basis and do not investigate the causes of the accident. Now, clearly, we don't have anything like that in Britain. But some of our media are subject to what we call regulation. For example, most broadcasters are regulated by a public body called Ofcom. Revelations about phone hacking by newspapers led to an inquiry by Lord Justice Leveson, which recommended an independent self-regulatory body for the press, underpinned by statute. Some papers immediately cried, censorship. So while the Chinese Communist Party says its censorship is merely regulation, privately owned British tabloids denounce regulation as censorship. What's the difference? I asked Lara Fielden, an expert on media regulation at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Censorship is when you require a publication or a broadcaster not to publish something. Regulation is different. Regulation is dealing with complaints or concerns that may arise after publication and then weighing those in the public interest. It's not interfering in advance. That's one important difference. There's also simply the degree and purpose of interference. Everything that gives governments or political parties direct control of the media is certainly to be avoided. That's why I think it's imperative that the proposed new executive board for the BBC should be appointed in its entirety by an independent body. This fear of political interference helps explain why Lord Leveson's proposals for a statutory underpinning of press regulation divided British friends of free speech. Kirsty Hughes, who was then CEO of Index on Censorship, opposed it vigorously. 
all the parties are trying to not be labelled as parties that are ending press freedom and are introducing a press law. But there is going to be an amendment to a bill. So the fact that this is been both shambolic and very secretive and we've got a compromise that doesn't hide the fact that here we have MPs voting on the press that crosses the line on freedom of expression. In my view, a limited, carefully structured framework of media regulation is compatible with free speech. And it would be absurd to suggest that it's censorship if, as in Germany, people have a statutory right of reply when a newspaper has published something demonstrably false. Then there's diversity. In Britain, for example, most of our national newspapers are owned by a handful of private proprietors. Brian Cathcart, professor of journalism at Kingston University and a well-known critic of the British press. The kind of press we have, it's corporate. I'm not arguing that it shouldn't be corporate, but it is corporate and we have to recognise that. And so these corporations shared an interest in not inviting public scrutiny of what they were doing, of what the worst among them were doing. Uh, the corporate press doesn't provide a, a, you know, a free market in ideas in this country. On the contrary, it provides the ideas that these corporations want to foster. That may sound a bit Marxist to some. But the concentration of ownership does put extraordinary power in the hands of a few. Remember Evelyn Waugh's novel Scoop, with its hilarious satirical portrait of Lord Copper, proprietor of a newspaper called The Beast. At one point, Lord Copper says that he has decided to give one of his journalists a knighthood. The Prime Minister kindly obliges. Anyone who's followed the relationship between British politicians and the press knows that war's satire is still closer to reality than it should be. A very senior member of the last government once told me that he'd suggested a piece of legislation only to be told, we can't do that. Paul Dacre wouldn't stand for it. Paul Dacre is the editor of the Daily Mail and editor-in-chief of the Mail Group. But Damien McBride, a former Labour spin doctor, admires him for his independence. Yes, he was fantastically unimpressed by power. As far as he was concerned, the power of the Daily Mail came from its readers and that sense that it represented the mainstream public opinion in Britain, or at least a, a certain bit of that spectrum. And I think his attitude was, I do not go into rooms with prime ministers and chancellors and home secretaries and just feel that because, you know, I am in their company that somehow I need to count out to them. I go in there and whether it's in private or in my editorial pages, I speak truth to power. And I think that set him apart from a, a lot of the journalists that I dealt with over the years. Well, that may be because he's more powerful than most politicians. Newspapers can also have too much power over politicians. It's not just that politicians feel they need press support to win elections or referendums. There's also the personal fear of sustained attack by the popular press. Brian Cathcart puts it colourfully. In court, in one of the trials involving uh, the Sun newspaper, it was uh, declared, one journalist witness declared that, um, uh, that there was a safe full of secrets about politicians at the sun, uh, ready to be used at any time. I'm, I, I'm kind of prepared to believe something like that exists. It's a remarkable fact that more than three years after Lord Leveson reported, the Culture Secretary has still not implemented a key recommendation, one which could prove very costly to newspapers. So when I say media diversity, I don't just mean a bunch of proprietors on the commanding heights. There will ideally be many different kinds of ownership, commercial, public service and civil society, international, national and regional. There wasn't much media diversity when Silvio Berlusconi was Prime Minister of Italy. He controlled not just the most watched private television channels, but also the state ones. He graciously let the third channel of the state broadcaster represent critical left-wing views, but this was hardly a level playing field. Some may say that all this is being overtaken by the brave new world of social networks where everyone can speak directly to everyone else, ancient Athens for more than a billion people. Richard Allen, head of public policy for Facebook in Europe, conjures this rosy vision. 
you can now go online and share your thoughts with billions of people at zero cost using very, very simple technology. That's fantastically empowering. What's kind of exciting about you know being here and now is that we live in this world of endless opportunities of connectivity. There are multiple messaging platforms, multiple social networks, all downloadable instantly and all usable instantly. And all of them will actually pick up on your contact address book and use that pretty much instantly to connect you with the people that you're interested in. Up to a point, Lord Copper. What pops up in your Facebook newsfeed is selected by an algorithm a set of computer instructions that is constantly being tweaked by the engineers. That algorithm is partly designed to reflect your own preferences, but it's also working to make you a more attractive target for advertisers, and it can have worrying consequences. In 2012, Facebook's data science team conducted an experiment which, as a scientific paper frankly put it, manipulated the extent to which people were exposed to emotional expression in their news feed. Nearly 700,000 people were exposed without their knowledge to more positive emotional content from their friends, another nearly 700,000 people to more negative vibes. The researchers found evidence of emotional contagion, with the recipients of cheerfulness becoming more cheerful and those of gloom gloomier, all the work of the algorithm. In the course of my research, I've had many conversations with senior people at Facebook, and I'd say that most of them are trying to get it right ethically as well as commercially. But when you have more than 1.5 billion users, your power is greater than that of any newspaper proprietor. And this information superpower needs to be checked and monitored. But I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Last but not least, we need journalism that is trustworthy. The business of journalism has changed out of all recognition since I started working as a journalist nearly 40 years ago, writing a report from what was then Stalinist-ruled Albania, hammering it out on a manual typewriter. But the qualities that distinguish good journalism have changed not at all. The defining value is honesty, the attempt to tell the truth. At least, that's how it should be. No one's ever entirely objective, but you can do everything possible to be fair. You can also be open about your own bias. Near the end of Homage to Catalonia, a masterpiece of reporting, George Orwell writes, Beware of my partisanship, my mistakes of fact, and the distortion inevitably caused by my having seen only one corner of events. In effect, Orwell says, Don't believe me. And so we believe him. So this is the media we need for democracy. Uncensored, diverse and trustworthy. To achieve this, all of us need to be active citizens, like those ancient Athenians. We have to watch our media as carefully as they're watching us. And when they get it wrong, speak up with a loud voice. That was Media We Need by Timothy Garden-Ash. The producer was Nina Robinson.